We are the ninth Congress of Brain Behavior and Emotion in Sao Paulo, and we are Dr. Antoine Bechara. He is an, a neuroscientist, and he's a professor of neuroscience of the University of South California, and a joint professor of neurology at the University of Iowa. Um, Dr. Antoine, we would like to know um, right now uh, where is your hot spot in your area or your main area of interest that you are working at? Well, I've always worked in the area of uh, decision making in the frontal lobes. And, and of course, this cuts across both uh, clinical populations. There are patients who have impaired decision making. But more recently, it also applies to healthy people. And I will give you examples how we are applying some of that research in healthy people. People, how they make decisions about uh, what to eat and, what, and how much food they should uh, eat. You know, healthy, making healthy choices in life or, or making good investment decisions. So I started, my primary interest from the beginning was actually addiction. Uh, and, and that's how I get into the area of decision making. I remember seeing a patient in, a, in an addiction a clinic, you know, with bruises over their jugular vein. And, and I asked, you know, what is that? And said, well, I injected last night some heroin there. It was a pure heroin that was being sold on the streets. And I wanted to get the best kick. And this is where it daunted on me because we were educated that addiction is something, as long as you take drugs, then you become addicted to it. And it turns out, and that's how all the animal models were designed in that way, that you give them drugs and the animals become addicted. But if, if you really look at the human situation, I was saying, why would anyone decide to go to do something like that, something that could kill them instantly? There is something other than just being adapted to drugs. There is a decision-making process. And at the time, you know, that's in the late 80s, the dominant theories of addiction at the time was dopamine, and, and, and there were the methadone clinics where you, you substitute, you know, one addiction for another. Nobody uh, ever was studying the issue of decision-making or looking at decision making as, as one of the primary underlying disease in addiction. So that's what got me interested in, in that area. So that's how I went to do some of my training at the University of Iowa with, uh, with Antonio and Hannah Damasio. At that time, they had uh, one or two cases they described in the literature about patients who have uh, frontal lobe damage and and, and had decision-making problems. But, but, but it was very, very early. There were only a couple of reports in the literature. So I went there, and, and this is when I decided to, to understand this problem a little bit better. At the time, there were no laboratory tests to, to capture that decision-making impairment in those patients in the clinic. This is how I developed what is now called the Iowa Gambling Task. It was actually the very first uh, task that really I was able to uh, detect that decision-making impairment in, in those patients. From there on, we, we started understanding a little bit more about how the frontal lobes functions and, and how decision-making is implemented in the brain. And as a result, I went back and I did some studies applying this knowledge to understanding drug addiction. So that's in the... Uh, mental health area, uh, but also uh, in the uh, healthy situation, you know, we were trying to uh, use or apply some of these concepts, for example, to the issue of obesity, because medically, medically speaking, obesity is always being viewed as a hormone problem, as, a, you know, a, uh, met met yeah, met metabolic problem. And even when you look at textbooks, everything about food stops at the level of the hypothalamus. But after all, there's a decision-making process that goes into that. People decide what to eat and, and how much uh, to eat. So we're trying 
to, to apply uh, some of that knowledge to understanding uh, problems like obesity in, you know, in normal people from, uh, from that uh, perspective. One of the hardest areas that actually we stumbled uh, across more recently, uh, again, it's in relation to, to the study of decision making, but it's, it's that stroke that hits one area of the brain, and, and usually it's the insula. And then all of a sudden, people quit smoking just suddenly, without any effort, without any, uh, uh, any, um, any urge to smoke afterwards. It doesn't happen every patient, but it happens in, in a significant uh, number. And we're trying to understand this phenomenon because here's, here's a target, target area. It's a part of a neural circuitry important decision making, but it's a knockout area that you knock it out with a lesion and then a whole addictive process like smoking, it stops immediately. We're asking, you know, whether this will also disrupt other kinds of addictions, you know, whether is it alcoholism or, uh, or even drug addiction. And we're trying to find ways, because you don't want to go and lesion anybody's brain, but at least find some non-invasive ways of, of targeting that area. Well, medication is one way, but I, I also think uh, anatomical targeting with something like uh, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. A deep brain stimulation is another choice, but again, that's invasive. TMS is, is non-invasive. Yes, yeah, but, but deep brain stimulation is you, you stick an electrode in the brain. TMS, it's, it's non-invasive. We don't know, but it's, 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 it, at least it's a conceptual approach where basically you try to target a specific brain area. Uh, as opposed to pharmacology, or, you know, because as we know, drugs work all over, or, or, all over the brain, and they may not be as specific as, as anatomical targeting. It just, it's just a different approach. In your idea, 10 years from now, would you have a guess of where this could be, or what, where you would like that could be? Well, I always like to see people who have impairments in decision making being normalized because it's it's a very problematic thing. It's a it's a big suffering to the individual or to the, to the family around them. But I see that society like to push that even further in a, in a different direction. They like to make normal people super decision makers. And there are people trying to see how you can boost the brain so that you can make a better investment in the stock market or, 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 or uh, uh, have a better intelligence in, in war situations or, or how as a pilot be smarter than, you know, better decision maker in, in anyone else. People are thinking in that way. I, I personally a little bit skeptical about pushing this towards the limit, because I think uh, what is doable is that if you have something broken, something impaired, you know, you, you, may, be, you may be able to fix it. But to uh, be supernatural, you know, to, to push things above and beyond your natural capability, it's something that I doubt it's that easy to do, but I, I mind you that people are trying to do it. <laughs> in psychiatry, a lot of people miss that point. A lot, many, many psychiatric situations, you ask the patients, you know, to cope with things and to do things and decide and things, while in fact, one of the basic and most underlying problem is actually impaired decision making. So all the instructions that you are doing, they're not working because because the process that allows you to take that information and make the proper uh, adjustments, it's not there. So that's why I think treating impaired decision making, it's not just an addiction. I think it's, it, it cuts across many, many neuropsychiatric conditions and treating that first probably is a, is a first important step so that they could implement every, everything else. Yeah.
Thank you very much. Okay.